So we look forward to these. These are very special, uh, um, rich times for our congregation to hear from our members. And so I um, wanted to give you a heads up on that. So we do have some birthdays here. No announcements this, or no anniversaries, but we do have birthdays. Today is Pam Durdall. Don't know if I've seen Pam. Is Pam here anywhere? All right, today is her birthday. Nolan Meyer turns four on Wednesday. Happy birthday, Nolan. <laughs> And Nava Miles, six years old on Thursday. All right, Nava. And then Steve Long has a birthday on Friday. Are Long's here? Yes, great. Steve, happy birthday. Also on Friday is Austin Pulver. Happy birthday, Austin. I know he's here. There we are. And Benjamin Zymet. I don't think they're here, but Benjamin turns two on Friday, and then Micah Detmer, I don't think the Detmers are here, but he turns five on Saturday. So again, no anniversaries, but happy birthday to all those folks. So let's stand, yeah, let's stand at this time, we'll have Meredith come, and she's going to open us up for the reading from the Psalms, and then the musicians will lead us into a couple songs. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names. Great is our God and abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that we could all come here today. I pray that we'll be able to continue to come. Um, I pray that we'll all be attentive to the speakers today and that we'll learn a lot. Amen.
King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be wrong, still be.
For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go out and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again at the sixth hour and at the ninth hour and did the same. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when, they came, or <clears throat> so when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired uh, last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Please be seated. Well, um, the plan is on the last Sunday of this month, we will resume the practice of, obser of observing the Lord's Supper, and the theme will be taken from six verses in the first chapter of Colossians. It's, it is a familiar passage, and it deals with the supremacy of Christ. Uh, we had been in the book of Hebrews, as you know, and we will return there again soon, but Hebrews is, of course, not the only place in the New Testament that provides us with what we call a high Christology. Um, Paul's words here to the Colossians is yet another hearty amen to that core doctrine of Christ's divinity, authority, and preeminence. Paul addresses Christ's cosmic significance, his relation to creation, and his relation to the church, and in both, he is the creator, the provider, and the supreme Lord. And so if you would, let's stand and we will read this responsively. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we will prepare to take up the offering. The doctrine of the Trinity asserts that within the one being that is God, there exists three distinct persons who are co-eternal, co-essential, and co-equal. The Son is divine in the same way and to the same extent as is the Father, and this is true of the Holy Spirit as well. Each possesses all the attributes of deity equally. However, there exists within the Trinity a voluntary order. This order is functional because the Son chooses to submit to the will of the Father, not because he is inferior. The same is true of the Holy Spirit's submission to the Son and to the Father. Again, there is no difference in glory, power, or essence. The voluntary order is simply one of operation and revelation. The commonly used titles of first, second, and third persons of the Trinity reflect this voluntary order. 
Jesus affirms this order in John's Gospel when he taught that the Father sends the Son, and the Father and Son send the Holy Spirit. The one who sends has a functional priority. However, we need to remember that even though the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct, they are eternally united in one will. They are one in purpose, action, and love. Also, though there are three persons in the Trinity, there are not three gods. There are not three deities, but only one deity. Again, God is undivided and indivisible. Unfortunately, throughout church history, there have been attempts by unorthodox groups to misrepresent this voluntary order in the Trinity, claiming that Jesus is intrinsically inferior to the Father. Not only is such a position clearly refuted by Scripture, but it leads to insurmountable problems, both theological and practical. From the Athanasian Creed of the Ancient Church, We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Let's pray, please. Father, Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge today and give you worship and praise because you are a triune God. Uh, uh, scripture clearly teaches that, and we want to worship you. And one of the things I remember learning from Wendell's series about God and love is that love would not be possible without you being triune and uh, each member of the Trinity loving one another and therefore we have a basis for God's love toward us because you love one another um, as each as a, as a person. So we want to praise you and thank you for who you are today. You are, we acknowledge that you are a triune God Please give the uh, elders and the folks who uh, look at the offering and plan how to give, give them wisdom in deciding and spending the offering. Thank you that we have a privilege of working with your kingdom to give financial, financially and tangibly to support your kingdom uh, being uh, on this earth as is in heaven and your will being done on this earth as it is in heaven. We pray, there's so many people who have hardships and needs and we thank you that we can bring them before you now. We're especially mindful of Ezekiel and Rose and their long-term challenges. We pray for Linda Hartman and boy, she's had so much happening this week. Just be with her, please give her peace. Please give her a good outcome when it comes to what's needed next with her kidneys. Give the doctors wisdom to know the best plan of treatment. Give them skill to carry out that treatment and please bring Linda uh, to full health and restore her to full health. We pray for Ted and the pain that he's having in uh, joints. We pray that uh, he would be able to uh, have that corrected with surgery and help deal with the issues that are causing the pain that uh, they would be alleviated. And again, Vanessa, I don't know how folks who have, uh, let's see, fibromyalgia deal with the pain. It would just drive me crazy uh, being in constant pain. And we pray for Vanessa and others who have this, that you would give them relief help the doctors know what to do with Vanessa's hip. Again, may they be able to find the cause and to um, come up with the, a, a solution that, that hits at the cause of this, that she may receive uh, complete and full healing and soon. Uh, 
Please be with our nation. I think what we need more than anything else is repentance uh, to, uh, to put you first. We are so divided as a nation over everything that's been happening recently. And there's so much emotion erupting rather than clear thinking. Help us to, first of all, submit to you and then may people think clearly to come up with the appropriate answers that you want for a nation with regard to all the injustice and the racial problems and the COVID-19 and everything else that's going on now. We pray for our government. <clears throat> Again, we pray that they would look to you uh, and find their answers in you, and may you be the basis of this government. May, may we have repentance in our nation from the president and the Supreme Court justices and the senators and the representatives and state and local government. May people be pulled by you to do your will. Again, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you that we have the opportunity to hear and to learn from folks in our congregation today. Please give them your peace as they come and share what you've been doing in their lives and what you would have us to learn. Please help us to comfort them and to encourage them. Thank you for the boldness and courage that they have to come and share with us. And again, please give them each your peace as they come and share. We ask these things in the high and holy name of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Amen. Okay, at this time we'll let the children go to Sunday school, and uh, we'll want the Sunday school teachers to join them, obviously. And Linda, I'll have you come on up. Did I embarrass you earlier? I think you were, you know, okay, good. I don't like to embarrass people. <laughs> okay, so we'll have Linda, and then Silas, and then Teresa, and then Sarah. So, Sarah, and then, so if you could just give them your undivided attention, that'd be appreciated. First off, I'll give a disclaimer. This is not you know, any hero things or whatever. I'm up here because of what God, what God has done in my life over the years, and it's in his strength I'm here. And it's in his power. Because if it were me and my flesh, if Tom were here, I'd, I'd draw on him on the four types of personalities. Because when I was counseling with him, uh, one of the, I can remember two of them clearly, one of them was public speaking. And the other one was getting shot in the shoulder. And I'm like, shoot me in the shoulder any day. I'll take it. And because public speaking is at the top of my list of fears because I am not a public speaker. And I told Wendell, dealing with the cancer issue is almost easier than this. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, Aside from that, the reason I'm here ties in with what I had to say. It's because I choose to be here. I choose to overcome. Along with a lot of what's happened in my life, most of it had, I had to overcome a lot. And I'm going to borrow from a little commercial here. I don't remember if it's State Farm or, or Allstate or whatever. I've learned a thing or two because I've lived a thing or two, and God's taught me so much through it. Um, a little bit of me about me. When I grew up, I was the middle child of three girls. Um, my mom developed cancer when I was five. She died when I was 10. Dad chose not to remarry. Um, so life was interesting. Um, to say that it was dysfunctional would be a fair statement. So I didn't really start learning about emotions and relationships until I was in my early 30s. Prior to that, emotions were either good or bad. I 
couldn't distinguish anything else. So God has used all of this to teach me. Another thing I did that I want to go back and say about my, my family, because it was dysfunctional, because there were so many things going on, there wasn't a real sense of being loved or belonging. And I was basically an unperson. I just survived. I just lived. Um, I was a doormat. I made, because I was starved for love, I made some really stupid, sinful choices. And I married a man that was really sick. Um, he had, he was very narcissistic, very controlling, very manipulative. He was abusive. There were different um, instances of molestation in my childhood. So I just had a couple of things to deal with by the time I started counseling, to say the least. But what is so great, I would not choose to go forward and say, God, allow this to happen. But I am so grateful that he was with me. It wasn't his will that it was happening. It was sinful man. But he was with me, and he taught me, and he strengthened me, and he helped me become a real person. And I saw my potential in him, and I had a chance to learn about love and belonging and learning how to trust again, because after the divorce, um, I was alone for um, 10 years, and I met a man, a great man, who was a real blessing to me. And that, that was an interesting situation, too, because of having to learn to trust again. It wasn't something that was done easily, but again, God's hand was on me, and he gave me a man that was very patient and loving and kind. One of the things that I learned was that there are many things that happen in life that are out of our control. But along with that, there are things that we can control and things that we can do. And so I learned through this to set up some boundaries that needed to be set up to protect myself from abuse. Uh, even dealing with the ex and going through a child custody hearing. Um, it was necessary. I had to learn to become a person and not be controlled and overpowered by this person. It made it difficult for our son because he had that influence and that's something that I continue to pray for him and ask that God will still teach him much um, I also had to learn about my limitations physically. Um, along with this, there, and I, I would guess that there, all of the stress over my life had an impact on my health. So I have a myriad of health problems. You know, there's been the, I won't go into all of it, but there's like the, the Lyme disease, the fibro, the, the chronic fatigue, you name it. And I had to learn to set limits and say no, because part of being the middle child and part of my personality, which was a pleaser, is to try and do everything that I wanted to do, and I had to learn to recognize what I could not do. I also had to choose to overcome many steps along the way. The other thing I want to say, and I don't, I, there's a lot I could say, but I'm just going to say this to that I am so blessed by our church family because when I get to watch different folks in the church family I get to see the love that's really there and normal functioning families I know, I know that every family isn't perfect and we've all got different stories to tell but what a blessing it is to me to get to watch that and to watch the love of mothers and fathers with their children and giving them security and love and a sense of belonging 
that will help them to develop into what God really does have for them. The other thing is, is the ministry that I've received from you folks over the years has just been such a tremendous blessing. And I'd ask that you continue to reach out and in ways that maybe is a challenge to you to reach out of your circle, to be more vulnerable so that we can really know one another more and embrace one another more and become more fully the body of Christ, I would encourage you to do that. Um, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. All right, I'm going to do this all wrong. Uh, I've been here long enough to realize that I'm supposed to get up here and complain about Wendell picking me. Um, I'm supposed to talk about how I've dreaded this day, and I tried to not make any contact with him the whole time, but I actually sort of wanted to do this, so <laughs> sorry. Um, and I also... <clears throat> I also heard that I'm supposed to have 50 to 70 minutes, so we should be good. All right, well, um, as most of you know, I work for the pro-life organization Created Equal, and as part of that work, I talk to a lot of people. Um, and quite a few people um, during outreach have told me um, things like, well, you know, the Bible condones slavery. Or they'll say uh, something like, You've probably heard um, that if God is really good, why does he allow evil? Um, and I've even had a very close friend tell me one time that um, their, their non-Christian friends are a lot better people than some of their Christian friends. And, and the implied question was, if non-Christians can be better people than Christians, what's the point of Christianity? Why does it really matter? Um, or another close friend said to me, that I, I really feel like God hates women. Um, and so what do we do with these type of things? Some of them are external, like things people say to us. Um, and other things are, are just come straight from, from our own minds. These questions, these, these uh, difficult, either difficult passages that, uh, in the Bible that we don't know how to deal with, or concepts um, like ideas of the world that clash with the ideas of Christianity. What do we do with these things? Um, I think we, we can all probably attest that we see pretty frequently, it seems like, friends and family members' faith um, crumbling or, or being weakened by, by this clash of ideas, this, this idea that Christianity is outdated, um, oppressive, and even immoral. Um, and we see this coming through the media and social media all the time. Christianity is this group of bigots, and they're outdated, they're oppressive, they're, um, they're not open to other people. Um, and and people, people I talk to on outreach frequently talk about, um, or they challenge the goodness of God because of things they see in the Old Testament, um, the, the way the Bible talks about women, um, the concept of hell, or, or this idea that there's only one way to God. So, so the question is, we see all of these challenges coming from here or there, and, and some of them are, are somewhat hard to understand. So the question is, what, what do we do with these? And there's, there's a couple things that I've found to be helpful, um, a couple things that I've, been, I've found to be helpful for me and helpful when talking to other people, and I sort of want to, or I want to share those Today, So I, I have five steps, and these are um, just ideas, and obviously this is not something to be met, 
meant to be followed strictly, but this sort of helps organize it in my mind. So when you encounter an idea that um, conflicts with the ideas of Christianity or a passage that's difficult to understand, I like to first remind myself of the truth of Christianity, then remind myself of the goodness of God, then examine the passage in detail, then remind myself again of the goodness of God and the truth of Christianity, and then remind myself of my position before God. Um, and I find that these, these steps sort of help reorient my mind into being able to deal with these difficult questions. Um, so, so the first step is remind yourself of the cr truth of Christianity. Um, and hopefully you all know um, lots of the arguments for, for why we know Christianity is true, why we know God exists. If you don't, then spend some time learning those. Uh, um, it's, you know, I, for me there's not, not a big struggle of whether or not God exists. It's, it's either nothing created something out of nothing for no reason or someone created something out of nothing for some reason. That seems pretty obvious to me. And then we know, um, we know all the, the proofs of the resurrection. We know for a fact that Jesus existed, that he was crucified, his tomb was empty, and that the disciples held on to their claim of seeing the risen Christ even um, at the point where they were killed for this. And these four facts can only be explained by the resurrection. So go over these things in your mind. You should have these handy. You should have these close to your mind so that you can... Uh, reorient yourself. So, say before you, before you even e examine this issue, this problem you have, remind yourself: I know this is true because of these reasons. And that helps sort of ground us for the rest of our search. Um, then, it, then we need to remind ourselves of the goodness of God. Um, so, whatever this issue is, whatever this difficult um, concept or idea is. We can have confidence in the goodness of God because of the cross. Um, even if, if all else fails, we know that God loved us enough to give his son for us. Uh, and that, that there is enough proof that God does love us and that he is good to us. And even if we can't understand the rest of it, that should be grounding for us that we know, well, I don't understand why God did this this way, but I know that he loves me because he gave his own son for us. Um, so, um, so then the next step would be to examine the passage or this concept in detail. Um, and you'll want to use all the tools of hermeneutics, um, use all your resources that you have available, talk to somebody who knows, uh, knows more about it. Um, because you may find out that this conflict you're having isn't even a, isn't even a, what the, the Bible is t intending to teach. So you might be offended by a, pa a passage, and then you realize, oh, I'm offended by something the Bible's not teaching. Um, so you want to you wanna try and understand this, and you may get to a satisfying answer, but you also may not, um, at least not right away. Um, so then that's why it's important to go back to step four. Remind yourself of the goodness of God and the truth of Christianity. Um, so if you finish, the, finish examining the passage and it still concerns you, uh, go back to what you know for sure. We know for sure that Christianity is true because of the reasons we talked about earlier. We also know that God is good because he gave his son for us. Um, and then we need to remember that this, whatever this issue is, it cannot change the truth or falsehood of Christianity. Um, so for example, if, you know, even if you find out that God, God ordered something in the Old Testament that you think is outright mean, that doesn't change whether or not God exists. It may change how, you, how much you like him, but it doesn't change whether or not he exists. So we need to put these things in perspective. So many people leave their faith because of something that really doesn't have anything to do with whether or not God exists and whether they should serve him. Um, so then the, the final step is to remind yourself of your position before God. And in, um, the idea here is to remind ourselves that really our only hope is through the gospel. We're not, we're not on the moral high ground getting to pick and choose which God we want to believe in. We um, have been proved uh, 
we all know that we ourselves are guilty and we know that God is good and and that that uh, that shows us that our uh, our problem is irreconcilable irreconcilable outside of Christ <clears throat> And uh, this reminds me of uh, the parable of the talents. Remember, the one guy took his talent, and he wrapped it up in a, in a cloth, and he buried it, and he brought it back. And he's, his reasoning was um, to the master, he said, I, I know you weren't fair, and you were going to ask from me more than, I, more than you gave me, and this wasn't fair, so here's what you gave me. And the master said, well, if you knew I was unfair and going to ask for more than I gave you, why didn't you give me more than I gave you to appease me. And so we're in this position where, um, like, even, even if God were evil, which we know he's not, even if God were, were mean, I should say, our best, our best shot is to try and appease him. So I'm not arguing that God is mean or, or bad in any way, but I'm saying we, um, we are in no position to judge him in the first place. Um, and the disciples, a good example of this, after hearing Jesus give a particularly difficult talk on how they needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood, uh, Jesus asked them if they were going to go away too. And, and their conclusion was they, they knew that even though it was hard to follow Jesus, it was hard to understand what he was saying, um, they knew that they needed him because he had the words of eternal life. And they, they said, to whom shall we go? You know, um, we believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Um, so very quickly, I know I'm going over. Um, I want to give sort of an example of how this might play out. So if someone claims to us that God, um, God commanded the Israelites to, to do atrocities to the people living in Canaan, and this person suggests that you stop following a God that's, that's like that, uh, so the first step is remind yourself the truth of Christianity. Um, this idea that that God is a, did uh, commanded bad things for the Israelites this doesn't call into question God's existence, but rather His goodness. But it's still important that we we go over in our mind why we know Christianity is true, because so many people have rejected God, have become atheists because they think that God isn't nice. Now, that's not really an atheist. I mean, that's not really an argument for atheism, but people still try and do that. So it's good for us to go over again why we know that Christianity is true. Then remind ourselves of the goodness of God. Even if we don't understand um, God's commands to the Israelites, um, we know that God is still good because of the, re the broad rest of the picture that we have. Um, and then, then we want to examine the passage in, in detail and maybe you would find that really it wasn't Israel that attacked the Canaanites, but they attacked, uh, the Canaanites attacked Israel first. Or you might find um, that the, the people living in Canaan were terribly immoral and committing atrocities to, to themselves. So this isn't obviously a whole argument, but it's, it's a start. Some things that you might find out uh, by examining it. Um, so, so then... This might not be a completely satisfying answer, so you go back to what you know is true. We know that God is good, um, and this event has no bearing on whether God exists or not. Um, and then, then the last thing is to remind ourselves of our position before God. Uh, we don't get to pick and choose which God we want. There is one God. He, he, is, he is real, um, and as we said before, we know that he is good, uh, so we don't, we're not in a position to say, well, I don't like that decision he made back there, so I'm not going to follow him anymore. Um, and God has graciously given us one way to be saved from our own sins and our own uh, evil doing, uh, and we can't reject that one way. We don't have any other options. So um, once again, I found these helpful. Hopefully they're helpful for you. Remind yourself of the truth of Christianity. Remind yourself of the goodness of God. Examine the passage or concept in detail. Remind yourself of the goodness of God and the truth of Christianity, and then remind yourself of your position before God. Hopefully you find this helpful, and um, yeah, maybe it'll help either with your something you are struggling with or something you're talking with somebody else about struggling with. So thank you.
I printed those on cardstock so they wouldn't be so easy to throw away. <laughs> and you can use them as bookmarkers if it is applicable to you personally. Um, this morning I'm going to be reading from the book of James. It's one of my favorite books uh, because it's so practical. Uh, so construction, there's just construction in everything that he says, uh, and it's all usable and applicable to our lives. James 1, 12 through 19a, I did include 19a even though there's a break before 19 because it's one of those situations where if you read it without um, headings, it seems like 19a actually belongs with the previous section versus the next section, which is an exhortation. Blessed is the one who preserves under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the de desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, know these things. So today I'm going to just reflect on what James is um, referring to as a pattern of temptation that we should become aware of, uh, not just aware of, but maybe intuitively start recognizing it early on uh, before it accelerates uh, to the last part. So um, I will go over these and then once I'm through them, I will tell you how they have affected me in my life. Um, and then we will move on to the antidote, <laughs> which is the, be the best part. <laughs> okay, um, so step one um, in this pattern um, of temptation, according to James, um, is attraction. We are, uh, we see with our eyes, we want, we desire. Um, and this can be applied to uh, any sin. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, something sexually immoral. It can be food, it can be envy, it can be, uh, you know, anything addictive. It, it can cover a various uh, array of, of sinful um, tendencies malice, slander, um, we're attracted to certain things and we, we see them with our eyes. But typically what happens in that attraction also is uh, it usually involves more than one of our senses. Um, so we may see it with our eyes, but we also may have an emotional reaction at the same time. And so when you combine those two things, you're really uh, becoming much more involved. Um, and I think about uh, The Four Loves with C.S. Lewis. I don't know if any of you have read it. I hope everyone has. If you haven't, it's a great read. Um, and he talks about how everything we do with desire can be good or bad. Um, and we have that tendency to make that choice of, you know, going in the wrong direction with it. Um, so all those loves that, that God gave us that are good and proper, we have the ability to turn into something else and use for evil. Um, an example, of course, I mean, there are obvious examples in the Bible. Uh, Eve with the fruit, um, thinking that it was more attractive when in fact there's really nothing to indicate that the rest of the fruit in the Garden of Eden was any more beautiful than the fruit she was looking at. Um, and really that was um, something that I thought was interesting because when you think about all of it being good and beautiful and all the fruit being available, and yet she deceived herself. Um, same way with David uh, and Bathsheba. Um, 
Step two is deception. Self-deception is the most common lie we tell to ourselves about the outcome. Um, we try to control ourselves um, sometimes, but often what I do, and I was gonna say this for the end, but um, this is where I just start lying to myself and I say, I can control that. Or I, you know, I can go this far and not go any further or I can stop that at any time. And uh, the heart is full of deception. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And Psalm 119, 29, keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me and teach me your law. And yes, we can be, be deceived by Satan. He's the father of all lies. Um, and it would be really easy to say that he's the one who really deceives us. But in reality, uh, I deceive myself. You know, I'm, I'm totally a willing accomplice uh, when it comes to being deceived. Um, the seed of every sin known to man resides in my heart resides in my mind, resides in my flesh. Through salvation in Christ, the reign of sin no longer exists, but sin remains in us until we are like him. And so it's so easy to deceive yourself about anything. Um, Step three, uh, preoccupation. You can't stop thinking uh, about the object of your affection. When you get to preoccupation, you usually have several things involved. Affection, some emotion, it could be lust. Uh, I mean, there, it could be anything. It could be envy. It could be just, you know, mal intent uh, against a brother or sister. Um, and so you're, you become preoccupied with the object of your affection. The movie plays over and over in your head. And this is where your attraction can actually combine with affection or another emotion. Um, for instance, obviously, if I visually see someone, um, it's easy for me to combine lust with that uh, and so I've involved more of my senses. Um, this usually creates a fantasy cycle, and um, not to speak, um, I wish Tom were here. <laughs> I don't want to go off, off track, but um, fantasies um, are things that play over and over in our minds, and um, fantasies are always perfect in our minds. That's why they're called fantasies. Mm -hmm. And so, when we buy into that and we internalize it, suddenly the object of our preoccupation becomes really perfect, whatever it is. Whether it's, oh, you know, looking at pornography, whether it's drinking a lot, whether it's sexual immorality, whether it's thinking about, you know, someone else's spouse, whatever it is, it becomes a preoccupation and the fantasy is so far from reality, and yet it becomes embedded in our minds, and we play it over and over again. This stage of preoccupation can lead to sinning in your heart, and I think this is a key point for me. Other people don't know what's going on in my mind. They may not even know that I'm thinking about them or about a particular sin, and so, for all of you sitting here, you wouldn't know what my preoccupation might be or that I've reached the stage unless I confess it to someone and am held accountable for it. Um, and so this is a very, very dangerous uh, place to be um, because it can lead to you actually sinning, even though you haven't sinned yet externally with other people, it can definitely lead to you sinning in your heart against God. 
And um, I think for me, that has probably um, been true uh, more times than not. And so externally, it may look like everything's uh, really good with me, but fact is I've already sinned in my heart against God. And so regardless of whether it went any further than that, um, I have to confess that sin and turn from it. Um, I call those secret sins uh, because they don't necessarily affect anyone else, but they certainly affect me and my relationship with Christ. God who sees the heart and intent knows all. And I thank God for his grace and mercy. Step four, conception. Uh, the stage when two things come together, this is really bad. So you've been preoccupied, you've been thinking your attraction or desire is there. Um, God help you and me and all of us if that third thing enters in and that is opportunity. Because when you're facing your own desire, your own preoccupation, and you're lying to yourself that you can handle it, this is when you're most vulnerable to conception because if an opportunity arises, you may or you may not be able to get away from it. You may turn and run, you may call on God, you may do a million things, but chances are you're gonna slip here. Um, and I just say that from my own personal experience, um, I think this is um, opportunity. Let me go back to deception for a second. Um, I deceive myself often. I, it's so easy to deceive yourself. We talk about deception, and deception in the Bible is mentioned a million places. It's just, it's all over the place. Don't be deceived, don't be deceived. You deceive yourself even in opportunities because in reality, you actually create them yourself sometimes. They don't necessarily have to come from Satan. Uh, your own thoughts can bring those, you, you, you know, you can work at creating those yourself. Um, all right, number five, subjugation or enslavement. You're enslaved and your sin has become full grown. You are addicted and you keep on doing what is evil in the sight of God. Subjugation simply means um, you've sinned and then you are enslaved in that sin um, and it becomes even more difficult to walk away from it and turn your back on it because um, you've all of a sudden not just involved yourself, all of your emotions are involved, you've involved other people, the possibility that you have hurt your own family just keeps going out in circles and circles and it's suddenly there are a hundred people who are hurt by what you've done or a thousand people and it really just keeps growing. And so the subjugation stage, um, our natural tendencies um, at this point are often to um, blame someone else. Um, like Adam, well this woman you gave me, Eve, well the serpent beguiled me, uh, David, well she was out there bathing. <laughs> so yeah, they're um, typically, um, these things uh, are easy to pass off um, by using someone else as the actual cause of your sin, when in fact you have deceived yourself or you have allowed yourself to be deceived and, um, and then you have fallout. Um, when you get to the subjugation point, the next step, even though it isn't on your card, <laughs> 
is uh, desolation because you've destroyed, you've destroyed a lot of things. Um, that may be family, it may be trust, it may be someone else's faith. Um, and as stated by James, the end result um, of this pattern of temptation always leads to sin, and sin always leads to death. We are then, by the end of these five stages, in this total state of desperation, and our only rescue can come in the form of grace given freely by God. So what is the antidote um, to stop this cycle of temptation? And, and it is a cycle. And it's a cycle that I, I would just really want to impress upon you to not just think about it, but ingra ingrain it in your mind so much that you can stop it at any, any point. Um, and there are only a few ways to do that. Um, Let's start with uh, memorizing the pattern. Just a simple five little things, memorizing the pattern. How do we do that? How do we know where we are? Um, to use a football analogy, um, when uh, you're watching a football game and uh, something's happening, there's an action going on, uh, you see all these little, you know, the little things out, the cameras are taking like every angle, they slow down what happens. So whatever stage of this cycle is in, taking place, you have to slow down. You have to slow it down, put it in slow motion, and step back and say, what is happening here? What's really happening? And uh, in order to do that, um, you have to be consciously thinking and being on guard and alert. And so when you slow the motion down, and um, then you can step back. So say you're at stage one, you know you have this attraction, you can step back and go, oh, let's make sure I keep that exactly where God intended it to be. Um, and uh, the same way with deception, you know, you can stop there. You can stop there and go, all right, I just lied to myself. I know that's not really happening and that I, I'm just, you know, fooling myself. Um, you can really stop and zoom in on any one of these stages and change it and stop it and uh, obviously pray about it. Take action early on. Obviously, the earlier we take action, by stopping the process, uh, the better. Um, and James, um, like I said, it, it's it's a book of very practical, uh, just straightforward information and instruction. Uh, later on, he tells us to pray, but in this particular segment, he's telling us please remember this, understand what I'm saying. There's a pattern to what's happening to you and you need to you know, really be aware of it and, and try to uh, stop it in its tracks. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And remember, as James said, stated, that every good and perfect gift comes from above. God is good. Um, and the one thing that I love about text service is when we do the attributes of God, I just think that that's so integral to help us understand how truly good God is. And um, it's, it's hard to, um, I think, oh, sorry, lost my train of thought. It's difficult for me sometimes to remember that every place we are, God gives us good gifts. And 
when we decide, when we are tempted and we decide to follow through with those temptations, um, we're basically saying, what God has given me is not good enough. I want it, what I want. And I've placed myself before God and over God. And that's not a good place to be. Um, I won't take much longer. <laughs> I, I've been divorced for 10 years. Um, and uh, being celibate is not like a natural gift to me. Um, for some people, it seems to be. Um, and so I, that is, has been like a long-term suffering. And so I feel like I'm probably more vulnerable um, to temptation um, than a lot of other people. Maybe, maybe that's, I think we're, we're all vulnerable to it, but I feel like perhaps in certain areas, um, I am probably more vulnerable. Um, and so I ask for your prayers in that, uh, that you would just you know, lift me up um, because every day is a battle. We have a spiritual battle going on. You know, sin still remains in us, and it's, you know, there's a war between the flesh and the spirit. And um, I was so glad that Silas mentioned the word and how important the word was um, because if we stay in the word, um, we're going to be able to overcome. Um, and in John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And knowing that God is good and that he gives us good things, um, I just pray that um, these cards might be helpful for you in stopping the pattern of temptation that's prevalent not just in James but in several areas of the Old and New Testament and um, thank you so much. I know it's getting late. Mine only lasts five minutes. Or just slightly over. My mom and I were always very close. We spent a considerable amount of time together. I relied on her counsel, <clears throat> appreciated her godly character, and considered her one of my best friends. About five years ago, she began to get very sick. Because my brother lived a couple of hours away and she lived alone, I became her main caregiver. Her health was very unstable. She needed, to, she needed help tending to her house and yard and also with some daily tasks. Her condition progressively deteriorated for about a year. Then one day she tripped and fell in her living room and broke her hip and her shoulder. For the next five months, she was in and out of hospitals and physical rehab centers. She became septic due to UTIs about six or seven times and nearly died. I spent many hours in the emergency room. But due to her unusual health problems, Sorry. Doctors and medical professionals were always sure how to treat her. Therefore, I did my best to look up information and advocate for her. During this time, obviously, my stress level was extremely high. I often felt that she needed more than I could give, but I did my best. It was in the middle of all this when I began to notice strange symptoms in my own body. I had an understandably high level of fatigue, but I also began noticing some strange poking pains in my back, knees, and rib cage. 
my muscles would get strained and hurt from doing simple tasks like op using a can opener. I began to have difficulty walking normally. My symptoms were sporadic and didn't seem to be related or make much sense. My mom died five months after she fell, and at that point, my stress level was much less, but my symptoms continued to increase. I was extremely exhausted almost all the time. Some days I could do little more than lay on the couch. I'd have to take a nap after a short walk. I felt like I was going to pass out after showering. I was often lightheaded and my balance was off. Some days my knees would partially pop out of place so much that I couldn't make it to the bathroom without a walker. I had mental fogginess and became more forgetful than usual. My doctor did tests, but they all came back normal. Then she ended up diagnosing me with fibromyalgia, but I felt like that was an incorrect diagnosis. It was hugely frustrating. My kids had to do most of the chores around our house, and I felt worried because I didn't know what was happening to me. and Nobody seemed to be able to help. I was very isolated because I couldn't get out much. I didn't have a diagnosis, so it was hard to explain to people what was happening. Finally, my sister-in-law suggested trying integrative medicine because that had helped a friend of hers who had had similar symptoms. Integrative medicine uses both traditional and more natural methods of treatment, so I found a practice in Fort Wayne and made an appointment, hoping to finally get some answers. They did some less mainstream tests and found that my adrenal glands weren't working properly. I was so relieved to finally have a proper diagnosis. Adrenal glands produce cortisol and help control many functions throughout the body. Ongoing stress, among other things, can cause problems with the adrenal glands. Now that I knew the problem, I could get the help I needed. The process of recovery, however, has been slow. It has involved things like taking a lot of supplements, physical therapy, dietary changes, and changing the way I think about myself. My bad habit of negative self-talk, as well as frequent worry, was adding greatly to the problem and needed to be stopped. Slowly, I began to notice that I could walk a little longer and less wobbly as my pains gradually began to decrease. I was able to start doing more normal daily activities. And though I've not fully recovered, to my great relief, I've stopped feeling like a woman in her 90s. Yay! <laughs> Going through these things has given me a much greater appreciation for the many blessings the Lord's given me. Life itself and the ability to function normally are immeasurable gifts. Each day, each breath is a gift from God and an opportunity to praise and glorify Him. I've always heard that you shouldn't take things for granted. Now I appreciate so much more. I'm so grateful to be able to walk and function with relative normalcy. The little things are not so little after all. I also appreciate how much the Lord comforts and provides for us in our hardest struggles and lowest times. He has blessed me with a wonderful and supportive family who have taken good care of me, and He's comforted and encouraged me through His Word. A couple of my favorite psalms during my most difficult times have been Psalm 23 and 91. As the psalmist said, he is an ever-present help in trouble, and indeed he is. Though I fail him often, he fails me never. I am grateful to be on the road to recovery, but no matter where I am in life, the Lord is truly my shepherd. I am not in want. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Silas. Thank you... Teresa, and thank you, Sarah. So let's stand and we will be dismissed. Always like this benediction. It's a, it's a familiar one. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May that be so. You are dismissed. Go in Christ's name, enjoy each other, and serve each other in love.